If you said to me to describe this story, I would say, don't believe it, but it's true. I can't even imagine somebody doing something like this. It's also the perfect crime, because sometimes the thing that's blatant right in front of your face is a thing you don't expect. I was going to be a million dollar winner. I was game for something exhilarating. From 1989 to 2001, there were almost no legitimate winners of the high value game pieces in the McDonald's Monopoly game. Uncle Jerry told me, if you want a game piece, this is how it's done. Hi, I'm James Lee Hernandez. And I'm Brian Lazarte. We are the executive producers and directors of McMillions, a documentary series on HBO. And this is the official McMillions podcast, episode six. Episode six, which is the final episode of the series. This week, we're going to have a very special guest. Former assistant U.S. attorney Mark Devereaux will be joining us this week. But before we get to Mark, let's do a quick recap of what we learned in the sixth and final episode of McMillions. So this is when the trial kicked off. We focus on the fact that most people don't remember the story actually happening because of 9-11. And most people pled, with the exception of George Chandler. He went to trial. He was found guilty. He appealed that decision. He was acquitted, won the appeal. And, you know, really this episode, we focused on the relationships, the fallouts, the forgiveness. The ramifications and, and where are they now with some of our main characters. And then we also get into the informant and who that actually is. We started this episode with Lee Cassano, who shared with us her story about calling the IRS. And when we had met with her, we certainly believed that this could very well be the case of who the informant was. Her story is, is very believable, and she believes, even to this day, that she's the reason why this whole thing went down. The way that the informant plays out in the show is literally how we experienced it. We went through all those twists and turns of what we built into the show, and we didn't learn who the informant was until the end, just like everyone else. Because this particular episode deals very much with the trial and the legal aspects, we wanted to have Mark Devereaux, and we felt that he could shed a little bit more light on the actual trial. The trial was here in Jacksonville, here in this building. It lasted three weeks, and it was almost like a couple trials within a trial because once we have the overall scheme, then I had to place evidence just upon each of the defendants. You have those grand hopes of being a million dollar winner. Devereaux says Jacobson pocketed those pieces and in exchange for a cut of the prize, gave them to friends and relatives. Mark is at that stage coming on very strong with lots of threats about the consequence to our client and the terrible situation our client was in and how much time he was going to get and generally we don't respond favorably to threats well without further ado let's talk to former assistant u.s attorney mark Devereaux. mark hey. well yeah, welcome I, to the show I just happened to have a wiretap up on you guys so oh uh, just just casual wiretap yeah just casual your background is in military law initially as, as a JAG attorney, and there was a TV show back in the 90s, JAG, which I don't know if that was actually... You know, they made, they made that after me, you know that. Right, yeah, we, we're, we, we have to ask you about that. But and for, for those who don't know what a JAG attorney is, if you remember that movie, Few Good Men also, you know, you yeah, get... Tom Cruise, I mean, the, Tom, I had to give Tom a lot of advice on exactly how to carry himself. Wait, for real? Like you no. talk, okay. You, <laughs> but it sounds good, doesn't it? Burned. It, well, you know, I, kn I knew that the TV show Jag 
was based on you. And we wanted to find out legitimately, is, is that the case? Like, was that, is that true? No, no. But, you know, hey, if it'll, somebody will buy me a drink, if I say it, I'll say it. <laughs> what is a JAG attorney? What, is, what does JAG actually stand for? A JAG stands for Judge Advocate General's Corps. And so a JAG is just, that's an acronym. The military is full of acronyms. The most exciting thing is court martials, of course, and that's criminal. And so that's where I ended up going into the, when I went into the JAG Corps, I enjoyed the courtroom. I enjoyed criminal law. And I did both, acted as both the prosecutor and as a defense counsel. Curtis Fallgetter helped you get your first job as a federal prosecutor. And then Curtis Fallgetter is now a defense attorney, and he was the defense attorney for George Chandler in this case. And you guys actually had to go head to head. And that's not the first time we went to head to head. And it wasn't the last time. The two of us frequently would be uh, opposing parties, I'll just say. When I was a defense counsel in Europe and we ended up buying a label for bottles of wine that they were making in Germany, our name was on the bottle of wine. I remember I brought one to my interview and I put it on the desk. Your interview said, with, you know, with, with Curtis Fallgetter? With Curtis Fallgetter. I put the bottle and it had you know my name on it. And out of the three individuals, and Curtis being one of them that were interviewing me, I know for a fact the other two didn't want to hire me. Curtis did. Without Curtis, I wouldn't have been there. Well, you've had a chance now to see the entire series. And what is your impression of the overall story as we laid it out? I guess the best way to say it is if we went out to the store and bought a coloring book, you could open the coloring book and you see, okay, well, there is Mickey Mouse or Ronald McDonald, and we got to color it. Basically, I think we ended up having the coloring book, and what you guys have done with the investigation that you did, you put the color to it. I learned a lot, and I think all of us have. Yeah, you're just looking at it as, did you break the law? How did you break the law? Who were you conspiring with to break the law? And what evidence... Is there to support that? You're exactly correct. And it was very clear, I think, when you considered like Jerry Jacobson, the kingpin. Jerry, we knew absolutely that he was the one taking the game pieces. However, we never knew exactly how he did that. And it was not until I had worked out a deal with his counsel that we were able to actually learn exactly how he did it. At the point that we indicted him, we just knew that he had done this. We didn't know how. With the arrests, you send out FBI agents and they make the actual arrests. Are you there for the arrest of Jerry Jacobson? I was not. And the reason is simple. Let's just say that I was present at the time that he was arrested. And let's say he ended up making a statement or he didn't make the statement and the FBI said he did make a statement. I end up being a witness of his arrest. And so I knew not to put myself in the situation where I'd become a witness. You know, I'm a phone call away for them to talk to. We flew to Washington. I briefed Attorney General Ashcroft in his office, his personal office. Then that evening, I flew with Rick Dent down to Atlanta. And this was not in the Bureau plane, right, with the Tide bottle, or was it? No Bureau plane. We actually flew on, on a commercial aircraft because that other one, it leaves something to be desired, <laughs> like, like comfort. <laughs> Rick Dent and I flew down from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, get into somewhere around midnight, and then we got up about 4 and I was in the boardrooms there at the um, FBI office. I had a couple of phones, and I'm getting phone calls from everybody, and they also were calling down to the command center, which is actually in Jacksonville. And we basically had the plan, hey, if the guy cooperates, just let him have a nice day, which, you know, they won't because they'll be eating Rolaids. And those that 
basically told us to pound sand, arrest them, give them some jewelry, silver handcuffs. We had ballpark 120 FBI agents across the country. We had eight people that we were going to arrest. And of course, you know, Dougie, old Doogie Hauser Matthews, <laughs> he wanted to be number one and he was number last, i.e. <laughs> eight. Now, have you ever had a case where you had this many defendants? There was 53 people who were ultimately indicted. That's absolutely the largest number for me. In one case, yes. I've had several where you get into double digits, but it's usually very few over 10. You like to prosecute people in ties? I like to prosecute people in ties because but a person that generally wears a tie is in a situation where the only reason they're committing the crime that they are is greed, that green monster. And that green monster has made so many people for so many years, decades, actually ruin so many lives. In this case, you know, we knew from the beginning, even if we have this fraud, McDonald's is still going to stand. And I remember telling Attorney General John Ashcroft at the end of my presentation to him, tomorrow's a good day, but it's also going to be a bad day. And I remember him asking me why, the bad day. And I said, because I knew, already knew that McDonald's was going to sever ties with Simon Marketing. And I knew what that meant. That meant Simon Marketing was going to die there was really, honest to God, only one bad apple. And it didn't spoil a basket full of apples. He ended up causing so many people to lose their jobs and lose their life savings. Their stock dropped the most of any stock in one day in the history of the world. Uh, or at least it, at the time, it did even think about Jerry Jacobson. Did he think about that? No. And the, the problem is so many people do things and they don't think about the repercussions of their conduct. He probably rationalized, hey, somebody's got to be the winner. So why can't it be, you know, what does it matter? McDonald's, they, they're still making their money. And I'm not hurting anybody. But, you know, that's the people that rationalize. And when people don't follow the rules and they intentionally don't do that for their own personal gain, generally you look in there and there's, it's a crime. People think of this story as a, a victimless crime. And we really wanted to make sure that by the end of the whole series, people realize that there are great consequences for what might be a seemingly small act of telling a white lie. If... Jacobson stood back just for a minute. He was the absolute head of security for Simon Marketing. And Simon Marketing is not just a, a small marketing firm. It was across the world, literally across the world. But why did people go to Simon Marketing? Because of their integrity, their security, and he ends up breaching all of that. Why? For greed for his own benefit. You think he might have thought, well, if McDonald's found out about this, don't you think McDonald's would fire you? And what's that going to do? Apparently, he never thought about that, or he didn't care. One of the two. 53 people are indicted, and most of them pled. What actually goes into working on a plea deal? How do those negotiations work? I ended up having to make sure that I treated everybody fairly. And fairly can be interpreted differently. I was able to identify, okay, if you're a winner, then you're at this area. And if you're a recruiter, you're, of course, more culpable. And therefore, that person is going to have to be treated more harshly. The rules prior to 9-11 were very different for what the FBI could actually do to investigate and so to clarify this a little bit, we wanted to play one of our deleted scenes from the series. When I first got to the office, I was assigned to the terrorism squad before 
We had uh, three of the four pilots of the, of the 9-11 flights in Jacksonville at one point or another. But it was long before this case happened. So it wasn't like we were actively investigating. That was not a priority at the time. So, I mean, it's not like we got pulled away from those investigations. We didn't have those investigations. It, it would have been difficult to put the pieces together. And when you go back and look at it, it's easy in hindsight to look at all the pieces. But under the rules we were working on at the time, it was very difficult to work terrorism cases because there wasn't a lot we could do before 9-11. You know, as, as a counterterrorism agent, I've been dealing with it my whole career. I, I worked it for a few months before 9-11 so I could see the difference, what we were allowed to do and what we could do and, and how we dealt with it. But everything, everything stopped after 9-11. The whole bureau changed from focusing on traditional crime to uh, counterterrorism. People that say that the FBI should just have been working terrorism, they don't know the FBI like I know the FBI, which is we're capable of doing both. The terrorism side cases and then the, white, the larger white collar crime cases that affect the country and we're effective on both fronts. So again, with, with regard to McDonald's, who else is going to do these cases? The local law enforcement? Nope. Too big, too many assets, don't have the authority to do a thing. Can't do it. The states, same thing. Cut with the border, not going to do it. The IRS, I'll just say great, great, but all on tax stuff. Takes longer. Money laundering side of it, maybe. Not this. So I believe that we are the only ones that can get a hold of these multi-divisional, national type cases, boil them down and drag all these people in, kicking and screaming, and hammer it through and do it in the right way. First voice you heard was Sean O'Donovan. We don't see him in the series. We've heard him on the podcast before. The difference between life before 9-11 and after is night and day. There was what's called the Patriot Act. After 9-11, let's say you had 100 agents in one locale. Cut it in half, because half of those are now going to be terrorism agents. No matter how many cases you guys actually crack and solve, there's always going to be someone else who's trying to cheat the system. Correct. Absolutely. I ended up prosecuting a number of very large drug cases. This one had 13 defendants. We called it the Baker's Dozen. The sad part is when you would take drug dealers off the street, you arrest Mr. A, and Mr. B comes in right behind him to replace him. And you didn't have what I look at is deterrence. On the white collar side, you just see greed, not need. And it's a big difference to me when you see somebody just, the only reason they're stealing is greed. And it absolutely just pisses me off. When you were prosecuting fraud cases early on, did you notice that you would actually create deterrence? Absolutely, in the white collar fraud area. If I arrest one, it deters others. In the drug world, it doesn't. It just doesn't because there's somebody else that's going to fly right in and take up that void. And so getting back to the case, you have all these people that pled, and then you had a few people that actually went to trial. Basically, the lead attorney for the defense side is your former boss at a certain point, Curtis Fallgetter. What, what is it like going against a former colleague like that? There were many times, both in the military, fight all day in the courtroom, and then I would go to dinner with the prosecutor. Oh, and, really? I, and there's one that most everybody knows, a friend of mine, Lindsey Graham, the senator now. We spent my 30th birthday together. Both of us were in Germany doing a trial that was several weeks long. But then with Curtis, I had a job to do and he had a job to do. And it's unfortunately, things bled off outside the courtroom into the personal area and our uh, relationship soured significantly. Hmm. Sorry to hear that. The first few days of trial are quite 
important. You're looking at this as a conspiracy that each of the defendants were involved in. There was something else that happened at, at the very beginning of the trial. Doug Matthews showed up and he decided to wear the same gold suit that he wore. When you first had your meeting with McDonald's in Jacksonville. Right. Now we'll play it for you a little deleted scene. In trial, it's a very conservative environment. But for some strange reason, Doug had a, a suit, a matching suit, pants and a jacket that was um, gold in color, almost like it had been made out of a, a set of drapes. And he, he wore it proudly. That gold suit that I wore once, remember I told you I wore that once. I'm not a suit guy, but that's a nice Italian suit. Much better than Deborah's nasty double breast garbage that he wears all the time, which is way out, way out. Nobody wears that crap anymore. I recall Mark taking quite an exception to it, and I think even sent Doug away to change it to something less offensive. <laughs> he said, go home and change that shit right now. Get that gold suit off of here. It was a really nice gold suit. I wish I still had. I don't have it anymore. I think he paid my wife off to get rid of that thing. No question, Doug did have a gold suit. And for him to chastise me for wearing double-breasted, I have to say, <laughs> uh, you know, double-breasted is still in. It has been for over 100 years, <laughs> and it still makes a statement. But you got to have the right physique, and he just didn't have it, you know? I mean, <laughs> he's sort of like a pencil, and I'm like a V. You know, I'm narrow at the waist and big at the chest. At least I was. Well, you know, he's an accountant, so he doesn't probably yeah, get out much. Yeah, that's it. He's a pencil. Doug Matthews actually showed back up wearing a, a purple eggplant shirt. Oh, he did. He had that, too. I mean, and then he's given me a hard time. He had some guy that I remember he used to get them from North Carolina, where he's <laughs> from. He's from North Carolina, and he had some special guy, and they'd mail him his suit. <laughs> he used to get them in the mail, and he claims he didn't like, oh, no, he's a clothes whore. <laughs> so he says now basically all he wears is what you wear which is black and white and boring and he was like so obviously it had an effect on me well see i didn't need the clothes to make me stand out see i've got a personality <laughs> and he doesn't except he does like to laugh <laughs> at his own jokes <laughs> Correct, at his own jokes, and whatever he thinks is funny. Now, you might have a few people who disagree with you because there are some Doug Matthews lovers out there. <laughs> did you pay his wife off to get rid of that suit? I think she did it on her own because she's got a <laughs> lot of sense. <laughs> so speaking of fashion, when can we see the mustache again? The big one? Yes. Well, I guess it's if it comes back in style, but I have to say I look at some old pictures and it, I don't know why, but I start thinking, ding, ding, wow, 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 wow. It looks like a little bit of like a porn mustache. But I guess that was the 80s. Hey. So the actor who we had play you in those reenactments, we actually were so surprised by how much he looked like you back in the day. He grew out that mustache, by the way. Yeah, he told me it was the first time I guess he was ever allowed to have one. Yeah, yes. He was very excited about it. Yeah, he said, I've always wanted to grow my mustache out, but I never could. Well, he he just wanted to look like me. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> it's true. Now, did you have a little deja vu, like when you looked at him? It did. I mean, he even brushed his hair back on the sides. I saw that. You guys did a great job on getting somebody to look like me, and that's why I wouldn't trust you guys for nothing. <laughs> In trial, George Chandler and Curtis Falgetter talk very much about how the prosecution brought up the game rules in federal court, and they made a big deal out of this. Obviously, McDonald's created the game rules for a reason. They explicitly state that they were not transferable. St. Jude's was a, a great example. of. I'm glad you brought up St. Jude. Mr. Falgetter frequently would have brought that up during the trial. But in the St. Jude's case, because they did not 
obtain the game piece in accordance with the, the rules of the game. They're thinking they have somebody that has sent them a game piece and trying to give them a million dollars, and then all of a sudden McDonald's is going to say, sorry, you didn't win it right. Well, they were in a terrible situation, so what they ended up doing was McDonald's said, we're not giving you the million-dollar prize, but we're going to donate $1 million to St. Jude's. And so they received it as a donation, not as a prize. The defense contends that these are just McDonald's game rules and they shouldn't be talked about in federal court. It's more of a civil matter. Your viewpoint on it was that this is part of a larger conspiracy. We all know what a lie is. It's not telling the truth. And we know what stealing is, is taking something that doesn't belong to you. Well, I come from that world where honesty and your integrity is everything. And then you look at what's called the mail fraud statute. The mail fraud statute states, in essence, he or she who devises a scheme or artifice to defraud to obtain money or property. So in this case, a scheme to defraud. A scheme is a plan. That's what a scheme is. So we have a plan to deprive someone else of their money or property. There were people that received twin Corvettes. There were like matching Camaros. There was the Dodge Viper. There were sea and these types of things. I remember a jet boat. We took the jet boat. When you end up having a plan to trick somebody out of their property, that is the scheme. And then you use the United States mail in furtherance of the scheme. There's no question like Miss Brown went up to South Carolina and she went in and acted like she had obtained the game piece off of one of their fry boxes or the drink cup and they she gave it to the manager. She stays around. They came out and they jump up and down. Yay, I win. Would McDonald's have come with the big check, have said, you're a winner, if they said the following on that document that they signed to be true, if they said, oh, I got this game piece from Mr. Colombo, and he told me to come in here and act like I got it off this drink cup and jump up and down like a clown, would McDonald's have given them the time of day? No. So they knew they had to do what? They had to trick McDonald's into giving them the winning proceeds. I never said that it was a crime to violate game rules. I said it's a crime to trick somebody into releasing money that they otherwise wouldn't release unless you had given that story, which was false, meaning it's not just false, it's called a lie. They say, I am a winner. You're not a winner. You're a liar. In this trial, though, we learn how Jerry Jacobson actually stole the game pieces. During the trial, I asked the indulgence of the judge to allow me to put a chair in front of the jury box. That became the throne. And I'm not talking about the king's throne. I'm talking about the bathroom toilet because that's where the whole thing happened. And he'd steal the winning tickets. And then he'd put in the just, hey, go get another fry, you idiot. And that's what all of us ended up getting. How did you react when you actually found out how he did it? Oh, I interviewed him, of course, for hours and hours before he testified. And that's how he said that he did it. Jerry Jacobson, he made a, a plea deal. So this moment when he revealed how he was stealing the game piece was part of the trial helping you prosecute, specifically George Chandler and those who were defending themselves. I was putting a color in the pictures for the jury because, you know, they all wanted it. They loved seeing that having the kingpin sitting in front of him, and I had him actually do it 
with the envelope. I had them do that in front of the jury. They loved it. I have to keep them entertained. I don't need a juror falling asleep. You know, you have three, over three weeks of trial, and they're going to listen to me all the time? I mean, hey, this podcast is 30 minutes. They're probably already tired of me. <laughs> I just woke back up, actually. Yeah, I know. It's because you ate so many hot apple pies from <laughs> Mickey D's. Yes. Did this actually have an effect? What did the 12 jurors do? They convicted everyone but one. They convicted four out of five. Meaning a conviction is 12 jurors. When you put 12 people together, it is amazing how a jury works. It's hard to get four or five people to agree on what to eat. I had to convince 12 independent people to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And they did. They convicted four of them. The people found them guilty. The court let them go. There was actually a lawsuit filed in Canada really running with the idea that Jerry Jacobson was talking about with not allowing Canada to win. And were any of them, did any of them establish anything? No. What ended up happening with the Canadian lawsuit was McDonald settled. And just because you settled does not mean that you're guilty. Absolutely. Because sometimes it costs you so much to just fight. It's like an aggravation fee. I'm just going to pay these fleas or these flies that are giving me a hell of a time today, money. Here's five bucks. Just get your ass out of here. There are a couple of shocking things that happen at the end of episode six. Marvin Braun is the stepbrother of Jerry Jacobson. You and Marvin Braun are now friends. How does that happen? Marvin immediately just embraced, literally he embraced what he had done. He ended up admitting what he did. He knew it was wrong. He accepted his responsibility. And then a little bit like Matthews, I'll tell you, Marvin Braun's a character. <laughs> Definitely. Mr. Braun and I just sort of hit it off. He'd fly up from Miami in a day, and then we'd t I'd interview him like all day, and then I'd take him back to the airport that afternoon with Doug Matthews and put him on a plane. And I remember one time we were late, late in the afternoon. We hadn't broken for lunch, and he's catching like a 4.30 or 5 o'clock flight. And we stopped off at a Bono's and got some barbecue. And then we were late for the plane. That's so funny you, you bring this up because this was actually one of the deleted scenes from the show. Here, let's, let's play it for you. Mark Devereaux, I think from day one, knew that I would never, ever, ever lie to him. I'm not smart, but he knew I was a person that just did a really, really dumb thing. I'll give you an example. I think the second or third time, I flew up to Jacksonville and met with Mark Devereaux. We did like two hours of interviews or whatever it's called. And he says, let's go to lunch. And I'm like, you're kidding. I said, guys, I got like a four o'clock flight. This is right after 9-11. I said, the planes are all gonna be backed up and everything else, or you know what I mean? And the, the, the people, the lines out the airports were like five hours deep. They say, don't worry about it, you'll be on. And I'm going like, you're full of shit. So Rick Dent, Doug Matthews, I, and Mark go to lunch, and they said, we're going to a place called Bono's, a barbecue restaurant. They took me to the original one in a, like a tougher area of Jacksonville and all. So we're eating lunch, and I said, you know, my flight's like at 5. It's now 3.30. We're leaving Bono's. I'm screwed. I'll never get on the flight. Are you kidding me? I got a ticket. But the line is like four blocks deep. I'll never forget. Mark sat in the car, Rick Dent and Doug Matthews would just walk me right to the front of the line. I mean, flash their FBI badges. He's official. Bingo. Right on. And they let me right on the flight. 
I have to say that's amazing that we remembered the same approximate time. <laughs> <laughs> and the restaurant, but, too. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can picture it in my head right now. I remember doing that. Marvin, he accepted what he did, and he's a nice guy. And then this is how we became friends. About a year later, Marvin was diagnosed as suffering from cancer. He came up to Jacksonville, Florida to receive a specialized treatment. And when he came up, it was the first time I had met his wife. He called me because I'm the only SOB he really knew, well, other than SOB Matthews. I mean, S.A. Matthews. (laughs) I'm the only other one he knew. And my wife, Diane, and I went out with him and his wife we ended up going to dinner, and I promised his wife I would be visiting him because, you know, he, he stayed here. His wife had to go home. And so I started going to see him. We'd go out to lunch, that type of thing. Just, you know, I knew he was going through a, a shitty time of his life. Just because he had done something stupid didn't mean I couldn't be a person, a human and a friend to him. And after that, you know, he's sharing with me his grandkids, and I started to have grandkids, and I've been down to Miami, and one of the funniest things was he invited me to his 60th birthday. He had, like, one of the floors or whatever of the a Capitol Grill, I remember. It was the first time I'd ever been to a Capitol Grill. The only thing I can afford is McDonald's. And <laughs> I thought you were a Burger we, King guy. <laughs> well, I... Actually, I do. I love McDonald's fries, but I do like Burger King burgers. Come on. (laughs) The flame broil, baby. You and Marvin have remained friends. That was something that we wanted to highlight, and we also found it incredibly interesting that you guys have become friends. I'm glad you did. One thing I've always wanted to do is I wanted to be fair with everyone. People might say, you know, why did you prosecute this person? Well, here's the question. Where should I have stopped? Should I prosecute Marvin? Because he was number one. And then you have all these other winners. But, you know, Marvin wasn't just a winner. He was also a recruiter. He was traveling from Miami up to New York, and there were some associates or friends of his there that he ended up having recruited into this scheme. Do I prosecute, okay, Marvin, and I prosecuted Miss Brown? Here's the question on fairness. Why would I let go somebody else that's a winner just like Miss Brown? I mean, if I'm going to prosecute Miss Brown, I'm going to prosecute somebody similarly situated because otherwise it's not fair. Right, then you're not picking and choosing and just deciding Correct. who should be. It's everyone who's involved that you could get evidence and prove was involved. They got prosecuted. Correct. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, as always, being so gracious to spend time with us. All right, guys. You have a good night. Thank you so much. We'll see you. Thanks. Thank you. So we only have time for a few of our listener questions. Our first one comes from Jeff from Chicago. How imperative was it for the winning pieces to be found at the right location, right time? I.e., was it predetermined that pieces would be found in X region around X time frame based on inventory reordering? Also, were there winning pieces tracked based off where specifically they were being applied? This is a great question, actually. And that is all correct. There was a time frame that you had, if you had a winning piece, to actually redeem the piece. But you also had to know exactly what food product it came off of or if it came from a magazine. And then there was a computer program that Simon Marketing used to pick the general region that the ticket was going to go to. Right. And you needed to know all of those things to be a successful winner. So this computer algorithm would pick the distribution center Jerry Jacobson at least knew what distribution center and how that game piece was supposed to be claimed. So they would set up fake addresses in different places to make it look like they were winning in different parts of America. All right, so next question is from Andrew Kohlmeyer. 
I was curious about the million dollar ticket that the first winner interviewed by the FBI referred to as million dollar instant winner ticket. I was under the impression that boardwalk was essentially the million dollar ticket. It seems odd that no one refers to it as boardwalk. So I'm wondering if it worked differently than I thought, or I just care too much about them not using the monopoly reference. There were two $1 million winners every time this game ran. And one of them was Boardwalk. If you got Park Place and Boardwalk, that's a million dollar winner. And then there was also one instant million dollar winner where you only needed one ticket. And it literally said instant million dollar winner on it. And that's what he won. Next question is from Mike Curtin. How did the press not find out about all of this? Every single one of these winners who came forward, who did these commercials holding the big check that weren't part of the FBI, in McDonald's eyes, they were legitimate winners. And you can look back in hindsight and see how the pieces connect, but it didn't seem like there was any connection at the time. A question from Darren Klein. Did the recipients of the prizes have to return the money, including St. Jude's Hospital? Question mark. Yes. So anyone who is indicted has to pay restitution. In fact, they're still paying restitution to this day. St. Jude's is unique. The game pieces were not transferable, and McDonald's decided to pay it as a donation. It was, in a way, excluded from the actual payouts. So St. Jude's did not have to return the million dollars. Our next question comes from Cynthia McAdam. Did anyone actually win the large prizes during this time? If so, what happened to them? So the game started in 1987, and the fraud started in 1989. So from 1987 and in 1988, all those prize winners, as far as we know, were legitimate. The first prize won in 1989 was $25,000, so there were some legitimate winners. There were also some winners throughout the entire game that could or could not have been legitimate, but because of the death of Jerry Colombo, the FBI couldn't prove that these people were involved or not. It is possible that there were winners who came forward and claimed prizes that did not receive a game piece from Uncle Jerry or one of the recruiters. All right, what's next? Matt Aubin, why aren't these idiots... (laughs) Why aren't these idiots still in jail where they belong? (laughs) You feel, you seem very passionate about this. So it's a really interesting thing. And this was a question that we asked very early on with the FBI. Like, why aren't people still in jail? And for white collar crimes, as long as you don't kill someone or kidnap someone, the sentencing is usually aren't as extreme as you would think. The next question is from Quinn Lamort. Or La Morte, if you're sassy. Did the quote-unquote participants pay for the game pieces and then split the winnings? Jerry Colombo seems to be making out like a bandit. Did Lee ever get any money? Where is Matthews? He needs his own podcast episode. Please, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. That is a lot to unpack. Every winner was a little bit different. Jerry Colombo was worried that people would not actually pay up. And there were a couple cases where people did not want to pay their recruiters. Lee actually did not get any money because Jerry Colombo died. She was waiting for it. She was asking him. It just never happened. Where is Matthews? You never know. You can never pin him down. He could be right next to you at this very moment. Undercover. Next question comes from Trina Padilla. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Good rap name. That is. How is Jerry's brother, Frank, able to talk so freely about his brother's dealings without the family being upset? According to Frank, he cleared it with the family to be able to talk to us. And the reason he knows so much is because his older brother, Jerry Colombo, was one of his best friends, and they apparently shared a a ton together. Robin obviously helped fill in a lot of holes as well. And there's probably a lot about Jerry that we still don't know to this day. All right. Next question from Maggie Marshall. All caps, big question that both me and my daughter have. Did the general public that played the McDonald's Monopoly game sue McDonald's? We understand that McDonald's doesn't appear to be at fault. However, Who's responsible for all of the hopefuls that kept going to McDonald's to get the game pieces yet didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning? 
McDonald's knew that the moment that they agreed to help the FBI by running a game again to catch the person who was behind this, they were going to get hit with a great deal of negative attention. And there were a number of class action lawsuits against McDonald's. Next question is from Neil Labarge from Heber, Arizona. So far, you have been quite kind to McDonald's. My question is, I have read some material of the case on the internet that states Uncle Jerry stole the winning Monopoly game pieces under the justification that McDonald's was intentionally holding back the winning pieces for distribution solely in the USA. McDonald's purposefully not sending them to Canada where the game was also being played. Uncle Jerry's justification being that the game is already rigged or tampered with, so I might as well get on board myself and make some money. Is this true? There is a great deal of speculation. It's something that Jerry Jacobson mentioned at trial. There's actually no evidence to corroborate this. We looked into it. The FBI looked into it, and in fact, we found evidence that actually refuted this statement. So even though he said it and it became public testimony, it actually just wasn't true. As far as Jerry being in the episodes, well, you've now seen all of them and see that he's not in it, but there might be some things in the future. We have had conversations with him. All right. Well, thank you for sending in all of those questions. We love answering them. That is it for episode six of the McMillions podcast. We're also going to have a bonus episode of the podcast that will be coming out very soon. Yeah. And the bonus episode will be a bit different. It's going to be hosted by Tom Segura, who's a very well-known comedian. He will be interviewing us. If you do have any further questions, though, please email us. And James, again, what is that email? That email is mcmillionspodcast at hbo.com. That is McMillian spelled with an S, not the usual dollar sign, which you will find all over the internet and my bedroom where there is a poster. (laughs) And if you want to record your voice and email that to us, we'll use that on the show. And be on the lookout for our bonus seventh episode of the McMillions podcast. This podcast was produced by FunMeter in conjunction with Unrealistic Ideas. For Fun Meter, I'm Brian Lazarte. And I'm James Lee Hernandez. Joe Fenstermaker produced this episode. Our consulting producer is Barry Finkel from Pineapple Street Studios. JP Hesser mixed this episode. And the music heard here comes from our actual series and was composed by Panar Toprak. Unrealistic Ideas is Mark Wahlberg, Stephen Levinson, and Archie Gibbs. And of course, none of this would be possible without the wonderful people over at HBO. You can find the McMillions podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the HBO Go, and now apps, or wherever you get podcasts. Thank you all again so much for listening.